Welcome to Hot Takes, part of AGO from Home. I'm Annie Roper. I'm the curatorial assistant of talk programs here at the Art Gallery of Ontario. Today, we are so thrilled to welcome Cameron Lee and Justin Gray. Cameron Lee is a Toronto-based artist who DJs, builds installations, collects ephemera, combining these with humor, making familiarity feel strange. Cameron's work has been shown at the AGO, the Power Plant, Mercer Union, Art Metropole, and Aaron Stump Projects. Justin Gray, aka Fisher Price, is a drag performer and writer in Toronto. Before its closure, Justin operated the longest running drag party in the iconic West End queer bar, The Beaver, serious rest in peace that what beaver will be missed um, and has written for many online publications including yo homo and lover boy he recently created and wrote the award-winning series queens a stylish campy drag whodunit that premiered on cbc gem aside from writing and twirling on stages justin is a self-taught costume maker for both performance and tv including work on such shows as such shows as big brother canada and vice's acclaimed true crime series dark side of the ring Justin wears many hats in the entertainment world, so stay tuned for more exciting projects in the future. Before we get started, uh, and though we're meeting in the virtual world, I would like to still acknowledge that the Art Gallery of Ontario is on Michitsagi Nishinawabe territory, Mississauga. It is also governed by a treaty between the Mississauga of the Credit and the Canadian government. Toronto is Michitsagi Nishinawabe territory. It has also been occupied by other Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and Wendat confederacies. Ontario continues to be home to many Indigenous people who live alongside settlers, newcomers, and people whose ancestors were enslaved across the Americas and the Caribbean. We are grateful to live and work on this land. Recognizing this in a meaningful way means making commitments to sharing and upholding responsibilities to all who now live on these lands and the land itself. In our work, let us be mindful of these commitments. All right, over to Justin and Cameron. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Annie. Hi, Justin. Hi, Cammie. How are you? I'm very pleased to see you in our virtual meeting zone. Yeah, I'm good. You know, great Wi-Fi out here too. This is actually mm. the Don Valley Parkway. Wow. Yeah. This all yeah. really cleared up quickly, didn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they've just been really working on making it green, which I'm here for. I can see that. That's fantastic. Mm. Yeah, well, um, the reason that I've summoned you here today is as per usual, so we did work together on a, a series called um, Bathhouse and Body Works. And that was a sex positive related party uh, with drag performances, music, video installations, psychic card readings for your tarot pleasure, among many others. Um, and the reason that we uh, are meeting today um, is that I'm missing my Justin time. I'm missing our sessions bitching at the end of a bar while, uh, while going over our general interests, foibles, problems, issues, and passions related to fashion and all the rest of the things that keep us alive and social. Um, we've been asked by the AGO, thank you very much, Annie, um, to discuss images and how they relate to either our worldviews or just influence the output that we make as individuals within our respective communities. Um, so I'm going to say let's jump right in and start talking about our images. We're going to start with myself. Um, we have two images that we're going to kind of expand on. Uh, so the first image is, thank you Annie, uh, Xenomorph. So for those unfamiliar, xenomorphs are a kind of adaptive creature that is a fictional character from the Alien movie franchise based on uh, designs and artwork from Swiss surrealist artist H.R. Geiger. The twist on this gorgeous image of a xenomorph is that obviously it's been taken out of context. Um, so let's uh, let's start by unpacking what we see here. She's glam. She's she, 
She's got high fashion. She's got danger. She's got intrigue. And yes, she is ready for the ball. She is running up that staircase. Like she doesn't need a Cinderella moment going down. It is great. Oh, she's not losing any shoes in this scenario, is she? No. Now, what, what I find appealing about this and just generally strangely anomalous about it is this juxtaposition, oh, art school, of the kind of terror of an alien figure put into this high glam scenario of what looks like it could be a couture uh, runway show or from what Reddit tells me based on this uh, kind of deep internet moment is it's uh, potentially a teenager's um, prom look. So respect to all those crafty teens out there taking whatever their interests are into their own a damn hands. I hope it's made out of duct tape. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> I mean, I, I wouldn't doubt that there's some kind of electrical tape going on there. There is definitely like the huge obvious camp aspect of it, which is why the hell and why was this not more active in my life as a as a fixture? This is bizarre and interesting but also deeply troubling and welcoming i just i find its presence is if now knowing that it is from like a, a prom potentially it only makes the gag of promenading even more funnier because it is such a like dog and pony show oh yeah absolutely <laughs> Yeah, yeah, one of those rights of uh, coming into your own, uh, of coming into adulthood and taking ownership of your appearance and really going for it. Little and the description. The galactic cotillion. Right? I mean, I, I identify with this kind of narrative around uh, the xenomorph as this kind of like alien figure, this troubling presence. Um, part of what motivated this as a kind of eureka moment when I was invited by Annie to um, discuss images uh, is this kind of collapsing of things around this kind of like anxiety around an unknown force like um, a viral infection, for example. I don't know if anyone's familiar with any of those kind of circumstances at the present moment, but uh, beyond that, even just the, the anxieties around um, things like a crossing of something glamorous with something terrifying and hard. Uh, so I'm thinking about even just starting back to the xenomorph itself as this like really amped up uh, monster. So the movie Alien being this kind of contemporized version of goofy, you know, swamp monster or alien movies from the 50s uh, taken to an extreme where it's this like weird phallic bug that is here to infect you, get inside of you and then rip right out of you and embody the most, you know, terrifying aspects of yourself. And what's more terrifying okay. than a teenager in full glam? Just teenager, you horrified. So even at 30 <laughs> years old, teenagers scare the shit out of me. That's why I dress like one right now to like infiltrate, like a Jane Goodall, you know? <laughs> oh, I love that. Yeah, TikTok is in the mist. It's really good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just just mingle. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to, to camouflage ourselves? Yeah. Well, and that's part of it. It's this um, this like weird mechanized humanoid creature that is the, the xenomorph. So it takes any kind of circumstance and absorbs part of its surroundings to kind of adapt to suit whatever uh, situation it's in. So it's kind of part human, part uh, weird like mechanized spaceship. It, and it's kind of shifting just to 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 bend in whatever it needs to to survive and thrive mm -hmm. and in this case she's thriving <laughs> this full kind of metallic skirt mixed with 
the um, exposed exoskeleton body. She's even got the long fingered gloves going on. It a little brings in the, the bigger question of obviously, is it fashion? Is it fashion? Like Ooh, those good. moments, uh, the Andre Leon tally at the end of the runway, Grouge kind of thing. But like, <laughs> you kind of have to, I, I almost find this as, I think we discussed this a while ago, but as a representation of queerness, in the sense of how far you have to push visible camp in order for it to be then like boiled down to its element of marketable fashion. So this is like a huge representation of, and a funny representation when you often think of like these things more critically of the extremes of uh, camp into the nuance of mod like uh, wearable fashion. Right, yeah. and and. It, the the slip between something being costume, something being representative, or something being about um, capturing uh, an aspect uh, via fashion, which is supposed to be something that has context that is every day, um, and in this case, it's the context when being over the top and outrageous, a prom. Uh, is expected. Um, so it has those kinds of rights that let's say, you know, a wedding dress would, our dream moment. And I, I mean, frankly, and this is an aside from my end, um, I, I wouldn't turn this down as a wedding look. No, absolutely <laughs> not. If I, I went to, if I attended a wedding, now knowing this exists as like a visual cue and no one was wearing this, was there even a wedding? This is a tree falling in the woods. This is a right. rhetorical gown. <laughs> <laughs> Getting into those deeper philosophical moments, fashion one. Just a note to any viewer, please have this as your wedding dress and please invite me to the wedding. Oh, yes. Jumpsuits for the bridegrooms, jumpsuits for the bridesmaids. Yeah, the Kim or uh, the Brittany and Kevin Fetter line, you know, just tracksuits, tracksuits, everyone in tracksuits. <laughs> Love it. And, 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 and hearkening back to um, the reference to Andre Leon Talley, who's always making, I mean, he's notable and quotable in the September issue for, you know, feeling starved for glamour. And I feel like that, that as a quotable feels so disturbingly apt for something like this xenomorph in a full gown situation. Always hungry. She's, yeah, she's hungry and she is glamorous. Mm -hmm. And even um, back to conversations around uh, fashion in relation to camp. Um, so uh, before our lockdown situation prohibited the more recent uh, Met Ball, the theme for the last was um, camp itself. And I remember having these moments of thinking, you know, what would, what would the queens that I know and love wear to this? And what would I want to wear to the Met Ball if I, you know, were ever, no, I would never be invited. But if I were to be, it would probably be something akin to this where it's, you know, taking, taking aspects of not fitting in or of feeling like an outsider or feeling like there are aspects that are troubled about, you know, my, my own personal feeling and psychology and then, you know, glamming it up, doing what the club kids did, just put some glitter on that, honey. I exactly. often wonder though, is this, would you deem this as camp since a big note of camp is failed sincerity, much like the Carol Burnett gone with the wind curtain rod moment? Because oh, this, this seems like a success in its sincerity of being what it wants to be. So I'm Correct. almost wondering if the camp element of it exists is merely the viewer just assuming it's camp because it is so costumey. Ah, mm. right. So when I pop you today, <laughs> oh gosh, yes, she is. She's out. She's out. It's just so fresh air out here. I get. Oh, my mind is clear. Well, yeah. I'm just trapped in this guest room. So be my guest. Go on. No, that's. I, I think that's where for me it kind of lies. Is like the element of extreme camp in regards to this photo is actually almost n not camp in its nature. It it doesn't have. A failure to it. It's, a set, it's successful in all elements. It, ex, it executed what it wanted to be. It presented it in a way that is tailored to make it exceptional. And it's been showcased in an environment which not necessarily would perceive it as something they'd want to see, but would be a place that people would probably be excited about it. 
So Indeed. Indeed. I think that's where it's almost, it borders the, the fashion costume because I think the camp element has just gone out the window since it's just perfected its uh, mission statement. Indeed. Well, on that note, let's move to the next coinciding slide, please. So um, the conversation that Justin and I have been having in anticipation of this talk is um, in relation to fashion and where the borders of what is considered socially acceptable as uh, an endeavor for beauty, glamour, and uh, displays of skill. So as Justin just mentioned, I mean, we might argue that that xenomorph in a, in a beautifully integrated gown is just fashion with a, you know, pop cultural riff. And also, and, and crucially, this image, which is from 1938, it's an Elsa Schiaparelli um, skeleton dress, which was a collaboration with surrealist artist uh, Salvador Deli. Uh, so it's silk crepe, very thin, that's been um, applied with this kind of couched or tufted stitching that emulates the skeleton of the wearer underneath um, that's then been stuffed uh, to protrude. And again, because of the diaphanousness of the textile itself, the implication of someone actually going out and wearing this, which someone did, um, a, a Hollywood actress uh, owned this and donated it to the Victorian Albert. Um, the idea and at the time was to shock people. So surrealism was all about this shock of people waking up to their uh, surroundings and own psychology. And then of Elsa's work was to shock the tastes of what was considered elegant and acceptable um, in terms of fashion at the time. And I can't help but, uh, and Justin, you brought this up uh, when we were looking at the initial image, can't help but see the echoes of not only the gown itself as being a kind of reiteration of this um, Schiaparelli moment, like archetypal crucial moment in fashion, um, but that even Geiger's reference to the inside brought outside and of uh, the kind of vulgarity of um, making explicit reference to death and to our, our bodies um, is, is still shocking. I mean, this is just a couture dress, uh, but it is kind of, I don't know, it's perennial yeah. and gross. It definitely doesn't lose its impact over the years. I mean, she did quite a few collabs with uh, Salvador Dali, including that dress that had the teared flesh look to it. I love um, that one. It's beautiful. And I think in regards to how this kind of led the, the push or the ability for something like our xenomorph prom gown to exist, it merely states the fact that once you have the ability to make something in this regard, it's already walking the fine line between high fashion and costume, then you can actually take that as an exercise to push it further. And by pushing it further, you increase the volume of idea that can be pulled from it. So I think in regards to this, this dress, which I wasn't actually, uh, I wasn't aware of its opacity. So I'm, I'm glad that it, to know that it's almost practically see-through. It does provide with that in, initial grotesque moment of not revolt, but like intrigue. And- Yeah, exactly. Like you yeah. wouldn't look at this and think this is disgusting. You would look at this and be like, oh, I've never seen this. And then you can kind of start processing your feelings of it, which Annette, I, I would say undoubtedly back in the 1930s was not well received. <laughs> yeah, pretty distasteful and challenging um, given the circumstances and times of you know impending world war, um, of financial disparities, I mean, not unlike the situation that we have been living through. Mm. And even I, I liked and I, I felt um, a lot of resonance to your comments, Justin, about uh, this idea of making visible queerness in a way that isn't just explicitly about being queer or representing what it what what uh, an identity is but more of a feeling mm -hmm. a feeling of uh something being kind of 
on the margins of acceptable, on the margins of being understood or misrepresented. Um, so yeah, this is kind of a representation or a, an image of um, what it would be to wear and, and live in that kind of liminal or peripheral of like be, making people uncomfortable in everyday life. So picturing, you know, a well-to-do woman who can afford French-made couture, wearing this grotesque but kind of beautiful dress to a function. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you can hear the gasps and you can hear the whispers and it's challenging and provocative. And I, I still feel that that is what gives it its potency. Um, like when you and I would dress up in a theme or whatever um, to go to an event in public off in the beaver. Um, part of the thrill and the fun for me was and is having a, a place to put it put myself out there and put the things that I think are challenging or interesting or worth talking about on my back and putting it out into the world and seeing how the world uh, bends and reacts to me. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I guess that's where the camp factor can become a, a, a bit of a, a tenuous one. Like, did you do that right? <laughs> well, I <laughs> think that's the, kind of the glory of both of these outfits is it binds together this LBD, which is always looked at as being like a classic staple you know, a little black dress, a little black prom dress, a little black cocktail dress, you know, no one's going to be miffed or bothered by its presence. It's It lives in a world of being a beige wall at a prefab <laughs> house. But like, because of that, the disorientation of each exhibiting a bizarrity, an alien aspect of the LBD is like, just mesmerizing. And I, I the initial guffaw from the audience and the onlookers around them is merely one of being completely pissed that they never would have thought of this. <laughs> like, let's just be honest, the dolls are jealous. Like they're gonna be angry. <laughs> true, true. And and riffing on that, I, I hadn't even thought of it in those terms, but uh, yeah, Schiaparelli was Coco Chanel's big arch, arch rival. So making this- oh, The gag. Yeah, this, this little black dress that's skeletal is also, uh, you know, a, a dig at that rail of, French, you know, good taste and practicality. Yeah, just a nice it, little hat, take an accessory off kind of thing. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Yeah, and, and the relationship to art and fashion is always one that feels a little, you know, tenuous, like, oh, again, should you, is there, what is? I've had lots of conversations with people who want for fashion to be art, and I, I don't necessarily think it is. I think um, there are, there's artistry in the uh, skills and craft and concept that can be applied to fashion, but I think it's an industrial thing. So part of doubling back to that first image, part of what makes it kind of special is it's clearly a one-off and it's clearly something that someone made themselves, but they've done it so skillfully, it, it kind of challenges and lifts off the, um, the canon of something like this Schiaparelli dress, which already is, you know, it's, it's a challenge. Um, I, think, I think that's a great uh, way for us to sort of seg into your image. My your favorite. Person. So I'll uh, introduce Oh, this was Moschino's, uh, I believe it was their closing look, wasn't it? For their um, fall winter runway line uh, a few years back uh, that was inspired by 70s game shows and at home viewership, which as you can tell, this um, beautiful, beautiful model is wearing a, a, a dripping in Salisbury steak TV dinner, which is the haunting aspect of it is just how eerily accurate it is like picture to picture kind of that's what a gross tv dinner steak looks like that does look like a pool of mashed potatoes like it doesn't exist in anything other than the fact that it is what it is it is you are looking hard at this exact thing um and this to me 
provides the exact same moment that the xenomorph dress does, which is this is exactly what the person wanted to create. This is exactly how it was tailored to look. And it is existent much like a little black dress in a world of a reality. This is a, a, like a very normal thing that exists around a lot of people that provides them with a very base nutrient level of okayness. But for some reason, the immediate response to it is, oh my God, <laughs> someone paid for that? It's like, yeah, much like you paying for the TV dinner itself, someone paid for this. And it exists purely for you to have a reaction to it. It has no other reason to exist. It provides virtually no warmth. I think it'd be great if, you know, if your boat went down in PV, it would be, provide a lot of buoyancy. But like, <laughs> other than that, it, it exists merely just to be disgusting and kind of odd. And I, I love that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, the, the, the connection is clearly related to things like pop culture. So I'm, I'm just picturing, picture this if you would. This dress in relation to the xenomorph has a collapse of audience to the screen. So, so you're wearing this and you're just chewing away at bits of, you know, frozen peas, carrots and corn, scoop of mashed potato dipped in some gravy from your uh, Salisbury steak while you watch the promenade of the xenomorph having her melman. Like they're equally grotesque and glamorous. Mm -hmm. And the representation of glamour in both is um, clearly thorough and well thought out and crafted with great skill mm -hmm. uh, for something that is maybe misguidedly disgusting. And for that, we applaud them. I mean, I would die if I could ever have a photo shoot moment like this in this disgusting and delicious ensemble. It is what I plan to be buried in. Like, <laughs> screw, this is my pine box. Just oh. you know, get some butcher twine around it, shove me into the ground, set the simmer at a low 350 for about oh, 45 to an hour, and then pull me out. I am marinated and dead and happy. Mm, she is done. Right? Yeah, it's just that whole collection as well is one of those things. Cause as you can tell the, the outfit underneath it, much like the helmet of the Xenomorph dress is very just banal. It's 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 a fun shimmery little, uh, I assume those are shorts, like a little jumpsuit. You can get that anywhere. Yeah. You can get that black prom dress anywhere with its little moray satin bottom. Like the, the, the element that makes it stand out is the impracticality of the overpiece, whether it's a helmet which I'm assuming the person had a very hard time seeing out of. And this, like, where the hell do you hang this? Where do you? Good when question. When you go to the bathroom, where are you hanging this? <laughs> yeah, you're going to need uh, at least a giant walk-in fridge to keep it from spoiling. If not, yeah, a whole team of people. And yeah, it, it, it starts to beg questions around context for I mean did someone potentially buy this is this in someone's private collection that could have been and might be worn in public um I I I, I know that this context with the seamless that kind of reads as you know a, a background for a high school prom photo gives me a touch of that reality fantasy kind of collision um but I do appreciate what you're talking about with this underlayer as being something very familiar, like all of the details read as somewhat, you know, kitsch, if not everyday fashion glamour expectation, big hair, lots of jewels, it may be in bad taste, but that's sort of the point. Mm -hmm. And then this, yeah, grotesquely oversized, familiar to the point of it being truly nasty, uh, is quite something. It, it, it reminds me of uh, a Kleiss Oldenburg. I know the AGO has uh, that uh, burger, oversized hamburger piece that I used to love to see when I was a kid. So anything to do with context, whether it's scale or the kind of inappropriate kind of freeze all of uh, glamorized alien. Uh, in this case, the weird alien representation of something familiar, trashy, and a little gross. Mm. I feel like uh, Jeremy Scott, who is the creative director at Moschino now, 
is very into trash culture. He's an American. Um, and then harken, harkening back to... Uh, <laughs> I love that you were just like, he's into trash culture. He's American. <laughs> For the record. Uh, <laughs> just, but to, the, just to put that in there. Yeah, he's, he's American. Yeah, so... <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get roasted for that, aren't I? Um, but hearkening back to uh, the designer's namesake, Moschino himself, uh, who was, his interest was in challenging the bourgeois expectations of high fashion as a pretty openly gay person in Italy, which to this day has relative conservatism within the fashion world, as we know for those brands who shall not be named <laughs> DNG. And also one of the first, and I believe maybe single-handedly could be possibly one of the only brand, like high fashion brands to put uh, the AIDS epidemic on their clothing lines because there were several collections back in the late 80s that featured um, Keith Haring's work and, uh, and the word actually, like the actual word AIDS across them. I remember seeing quite a few t-shirts of those. So it was a uh, very like boundary pushing, very like making sure that is as honest to himself as possible kind of person. Yeah, yeah. It, and that that representation of aspects of life that maybe aren't so glamorous, um, that are very human or that are very vulnerable. Um, I mean, talking about that in relation to this specific ensemble. <laughs> is is maybe a bit of a reach but there's still oh, yeah. that, embedded, that embedded memory in uh where this is coming from um and and i mean taking it back to the the fantasy that fashion portrays or the kind of um, ironic or surreal clash that this image specifically represents is this kind of like grotesque version of aspiration so mm. Even though it looks like a TV dinner, the scale, the craftsmanship, the designer name, the context of a you know skinny white model wearing this, um, which is again a, a very ironic and maybe even a little bit distasteful um, combination. Mm. It makes me think of representations in um, in in media of what that kind of disparity is of, you know, what a designer wants it to be versus the camp reality of someone wearing the clothes, thinking they look like the model and maybe they don't so much. Um, so <laughs> it also like, it can't go without saying how Mars attacks this looks, right? Like an alien pretending to be human with that giant hair, it just, it gives me that immediate response of this is, these are all alien people just dressed up in human skin trying to make it happen, which <laughs> <laughs> I mean, aren't we all, but. <laughs> That's a relatable sentiment. And I, feel like, <laughs> I feel like I've spent a lot of time trying and not always successfully doing human. Yeah, just unzip <laughs> us and we're filled with bugs like Edgar and Men in Black. It's just very that. Very Ugh. <laughs> Well, when will be the day when we're all wearing giant TV dinners? Is this, are, are we on the precipice of this becoming the moment? Well, what do you think I've been doing here? I mean, I have all this space in my new studio, of course, outdoors. So I've been procuring all the elements to make TV dinners, including vegan options for everyone I know. Oh my gosh. You know. Unbelievable. Yeah, just doing my part. <laughs> Now, how do we feel? Do we want to uh, sashay into our next image? I think we should get on to our few last last image because she is kind of the culmination of everything we've been talking about, and we have some we have some explaining to do when it comes to her existence. All and right, then, love there she is. Oh, Snooky! Bless her. Bless the meatball. <sighs> yeah, let's just pour over this. Let's let's let's. Do a tete a toe sitch. You oh. go. Oh, I may I jump off. We I'm we first have the, the ever <laughs> the iconic created bump in the hair, um, made by made famous by our Lord and Savior here, Snooky, uh, including the the faux Chanel glasses with the chain, 
Um, and then we make our down to the, the decolletage area where we have a, a very hermetic and beautiful neck brace that she procured after driving incorrectly in uh, Italy and getting herself into a small umptita, a fender bender. Um, down to this, uh, this blouse jacket. Um, not much to say there, but hey, it's there, it's on. We celebrate that with a, a nice, like a, like a just nice heaving bosom, as they would say, and uh, the finger to point at you and just let you know you're doing something wrong, Mr. Paparazzi. Um, down to the, the juice bottle hanging out of the oversized Gucci bag, the tiny, tiny cutoff shorts, and our, our forever moment, the, the Sherpa, the, the super hairy, furry Ugg boot. Mm. Yeah, it, dinner, it, dinner served everyone. That's what oh, this outfit does. Yeah. I'm all ready for seconds and I haven't even started. Oh, a moose bouche, because it's a moose. Yeah. Yeah, the proportion and scale here is wild. I love that she's um, taken the volume and height of the bump it, oh. echoed in the neck brace with the purse for scale. And of course, the um, bushy, bushy booties that really say, hi, it may be beige, but it's fashion, honey. Look it up. They're just really grounding, you know? Like they, it says, I have an earth sign somewhere in me. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I do wonder about Snooky's 10th uh, house careers. Oh, well. We'll contact some locals and find out. Oh yeah, we're gonna look at her chart later, folks. <laughs> Highly recommend a good Google. Very telling. <laughs> well, and the context, right? So we've also got a lot of context versus some of these other images that seem somewhat removed or staged. This is in situ. Snooky is hitting the cobblestones of She's the subtext of, of everything prior to being on paper. Well, would we argue that based on all of our conversation leading to this point, that Snooky is camp? Is Snooky camp? What do we think? I, once again, I don't know because it depends on the directive in which she's based. Because she is just a physical combination of where fashion marketed itself into. It painted itself into a corner where you get people that you've created as celebrities to wear nothing but things that you've created to be on these celebrities. Therefore, they are just covered in monogram, not so much in her case here, but like the Ugg boot, the, the Gucci bag, the faux Chanel glasses, you know, everything's playing into this aspect of she is aware that what she's doing is, pre like she's present for what she's doing. So I don't know if there has that element of camp where it's a failure because she's succeeding in herself, like she's succeeding in her brand as this kind of person. She's made it basically. She's done. <laughs> or not we care for it, irrelevant, because we do care for it. We love but it. Yeah. Surrounding crossed arms, is it skepticism or is it the shock of the new? I Well, we don't, I know she, I know actually in this photo she is yelling at paparazzi, so imagine if you would this this very small woman adorned in so many different layers of like in and out volume on every aspect of her presence uh yelling at these italian paparazzi <laughs> so maybe the i mean argument's sake here maybe the the grotesqueness is the spectacle of this kind of reality celebrity culture is that maybe the, the component where the audience is then implicated a little here? Are we getting to uh, this pop is party? For me, the alien that you invited in. The other ones were something you were a witness to, but this is a person that we as a society have created. We have said, these things are deemed important. These aspects of life are important. These uh, pieces of fabric are important and the presentation of your existence is important because it is here to entertain us. So the alien aspect is for surely the amount of people just staring at her and both physically and on the other side of the television screen. 
and just being baffled by this person's existence when in fact they are the people that existed or created this person's existence by just creating like boiling down all of the elements that they put into the pot to make her happen not that her herself as a human is impractical or useless but the way that the presentation of her existence was given and manicured to the audience to create a moment like this where it has every every moving part of it is 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 camp it is absolute there is no reason she has a neck brace that big when in like five minutes after this episode she takes it off this is just for the drama all of this is for the the immediate guffaw the 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 <gasps> moment when you see her and that's why i feel like she and the xenomorph flow into each other because of how you process art there's a simulation a simulacra and the reality right and i think we've gotten down to the point where snooki herself is almost a simulacra of what we want of all of these things i don't know if i'm talking myself into a corner here <laughs> no no I, I i'm i'm feeling that i'm feeling that statement it's um she's she's representing all of the available where's faculties in context for a moment mm -hmm. um, and she definitely represents and is an emblem or yeah uh, I don't know if I would call her a villain but of the anxieties of her time mm -hmm. and yeah the, the styling and scale of of her is truly it's like a mannerist or a surreal image the, the strange combination of textures and of uh, difference in scale um, that is still so close to the body. Mm -hmm. So much like the xenomorph, uh, I mean, we're really seeing Snooky. Uh, despite all of the like elements and trappings, she's on full display here. And so are we. We're, we're, I can't look away. I want to know what else is in that bag. I'm <laughs> sure. Also, the like, she, although not queer herself, is an embodiment of a physical presence of queerness. She is the oddball out in this situation. She, like, she's surrounded by like that guy's got flip flops on. Like, yeah, yeah. You know? There was the no everyone that we see leading up to her in our photos was it a complete design of a moment of a feeling, whereas Snooky. The only design that exists was her celebrity and her existence now catches us in an uncanny valley when you see someone like her in real life wearing all these things because it isn't the reality of the real it is the reality of reality tv and by the nature of something like a xenomorph you already have the fantastical knowledge of feeling comfort knowing that it's fictitious which leads into her existence, which is not fictitious. It's a, it's a literal existence. And it, it encompasses this alien queerness of presence and accountability and like the way that these, these people look in this environment. It's, it's, very, it's, it's a very abstract way of giving her a compliment on thank you for being so bizarre and just owning it kind of thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Um... All, all of it is out there for you. And unlike you, just as you've said to echo your statement, unlike the xenomorph, um, she exists. <laughs> she exists. She, she's Wouldn't it be great if she like found this and was like, wow, I'm really cool. And you're like, I don't know if we even said that. I, I believe it internally, but like, did I say that? <laughs> you just did. Oh shit. Quoted. Quoted and and the, yeah, the liberating, terrifying aspect of someone really going for it, putting themselves out there and doing it as unapologetically as I could imagine, mm -hmm. um, is yeah, and in, in that in that queer sense, in the queer strange, the queer of um, of challenging expectation. Um, I would say what's camp is, um, well, I don't know, I guess, is it, it would be potentially camp to think that we ourselves watching this wouldn't be seen 
with the same kind of uh, shock or disturbed confusion mm -hmm. from someone on the street. And again, to, to my statement earlier, this, uh, this fantastic creature that is Snooky, she put herself into a public space and really put herself on display unapologetically. And I applaud her for that. Oh, absolutely. I think, I think it's the, the embracing it of it all, like be, whether it's conscious or subconscious, she's pulling, it, it's a lot like all the other elements or the other slides we had. It's, it's the sheer embracing of it, of falling completely into this costume, whether it's, well, yeah, it, you, there is, there, there's no really other way because you're selling the garment, right? Like all of those people sold it to us, even that mannequin wearing the Scaparelli dress. I wanted that dress because it's so cool. And she's selling this, she's selling her entire presence as almost a garment. It's not so much something you can zip on and take off physically, but like completely as like an internal like way of thinking of your, about your life. It's leading with confidence. She has the confidence to put all this shit on and just be like, I don't care, which inherently goes a lot into what queerness is when you fully start accepting it for yourself. It's like, I don't care. And I think yeah. we've kind of reached a boiling point with isolation and everything happening now that I feel like this kind of presence of giving a shitness is gone out the window. And I will fully judge people if they don't look weird on the streets these days. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, there have been those moments and this is, um, from the initial um, prospect of the the xenomorph alien in a public space and the anxiety of not knowing um, when, how, and who will cause that um, contagion in reality, walking back into it slowly and being forced back into our, um, our quarantine a lot of hairy eyeballs. I, I had a lot of strange encounters in public, some pretty harmless, some potentially kind of scary. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I mean, it, it, it stands that something like the Schiaparelli skeleton dress, which comes from a rarefied space, still has the power to shock and disturb in the same sense that this kind of hyper wild and unbridled femme queer, whether or not, as you said, uh, Snooky is, um, uh, way of being and doing is still challenging. Well, it's very hyper conformity. It's, she is doing, she is layered with every aspect of conformity of that time to a point where it is problem pattern on top of problem pattern on top of problem pattern. <laughs> so <laughs> she is unwittingly being a, a very anti-conformist person by having so much conformity on her, the Ugg boot, the, the cut off shorts, the monogram bag, all of these aspects. Like, so in that, in that sense, there is camp to, mm -hmm. to what she's doing. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a really bizarre norm core. <laughs> She did it first, folks. Yeah, just to be norm course, Nikki. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I've seen plenty of people who've embraced the, the comfort factor of the UGG and as something that is sort of uh, anti-fashion that has been absorbed into fashion. I mean, there's nostalgia to it. It is still shockingly comfortable. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and that... I guess there is a little bit of room for a nostalgia for this time because enough has passed that something like this, you know, light wash denim and all beige, just display of strange volumes is comforting. Yeah, it's I'm no longer starved for fashion. I'm full of it. Oh, yes, this yeah. is this is this is dessert. This was a mukbang of fashion. I'm, I'm <laughs> filled. <laughs> well, it is nice to actually dress up again. It's been a very long quarantine. No, I know. I was really excited to like fluff around with makeup and like look like a an 18 year old. 
and me like um, an 88 year old. <sighs> hmm. well, so we that- will all dress as Snooky in the park together. <laughs> I'm feeling inspired. Maybe I'm gonna just, you know, stick some food on me and get a couple of skeletons and some Uggs. Yeah, what have you had to eat today? I'm, well, not everywhere. <laughs> it's like, you want guava? Here, throw it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I don't know if I wanna eat a cake or nothing. It's just an enjoyable experience chatting with y'all. Yes, over your nice, what, Canada dry? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. Mm. Keeping it sober. I'll get those tasting <laughs> notes later from you. <laughs> Sugar. <laughs> Refined cornstarch. <laughs> yeah, it thickens me. <laughs> well, on that note, um, I think we are, unless you have any other thoughts that you'd like to share. No, I mean, to quote Snooky, Cap's here, you know? <laughs> Is the bus still running? Yes. Is it? My duck phone is ringing. I have to, <laughs> you know. Oh my God, my, my TV dinner dress has arrived. The <laughs> alien. Oh. Is it still warm? Oh, tempid, tempid. It always is. The gravy always coagulates by the time it gets here. Mm. Thank you so much to Annie Broper and to the team at the AGO for inviting us and for making space. And thank you to anyone who tuned in. Anyone? Anybody? Bueller, hey. Bueller, Polly, <laughs> Polly D, Sugar Bear Hair, anyone? Anyway, I have to not hit the gym. I would never. Oh. I do have laundry, and I'm sure I'm going to be enjoying something tan to eat for dinner. Yeah. A nice beige, a nice beige, a grage. Yeah, maybe some. Uh, I don't know, fried chicken to go with this beige drink. Oh. Why even bother? Just get some butcher's paper. Just eat that. (laughs) I'm strangely addicted to that stuff. Mm. (laughs) Well, thank you for having me. This was really nice and a super bizarre way to end my day (laughs) of work. (laughs) Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to whatever is next and to whatever you have next. Um, go watch Queens if you haven't watched it a million times like I have. Thank you. Uh, okay. I don't know how we close these things out. Do we just exit the, the chat? I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. know. This is such a mystery. And this is all recorded too. Oh my God, they're going to see us fail. Oh my God. For the ages. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. All right. Goodbye, everyone. Bye.